Welcome Emily Pachuda, Chief Marketing and Analytics Officer of the Americas at Invesco. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Amanda. Absolutely. Well, we'll dive right in. I'd love it if you could tell us about what your company does, what your role is there, and maybe a brief synopsis of your career path of how you got to here. And I'm particularly interested in, I saw that you were Chief Marketing Officer and then added on analytics. So I'd love to hear a little bit about that part of your journey as well. Sounds great, Amanda. Yeah, so let me tell you a little bit about Invesco first. Um, you know, Invesco is a global company. Uh, we're um, in the industry called asset management, which means that we are um, creating investment products and working with clients who are, whether they're financial advisors, institutional investors, or individual investors um, to help them build uh, portfolios. But what I really like to think that we're really doing, um, you know, that's sort of factually what we're doing, but really what we're doing um, is helping people achieve the dreams and aspirations that they have for themselves and their families for which money is, is a catalyst, right? And so um, we really um, are a purpose-driven organization. And, um, you know, I think that we really do view that as really what we do, um, as opposed to um, sort of the factual nature of what we do, which is um, creating investment products. Well, that um, really humanizes it, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, like, uh, you know, it's something, it's why I've always really been so fascinated and attracted to um, the, also the general financial services industry, which is really where I've built my career as a marketer, um, is that, you know, money is a means to an end. And yet, you know, People are really, really trying to save for dignified retirements and for their, their um, children's education. And if you're an employer, you want your employees and your team members to have successful retirement savings. And, you know, like, so I, I've always I've found it um, to be a, a somewhat, you know, noble profession if done well, um, you know, and, and that's certainly something that purpose has, has attracted me, attracted me to the, to the industry, certainly. Yes. Um, yeah, so my role at, um, at Invesco is the Chief Marketing and Analytics Officer, as you said, for um, Invesco. And, you know, when I was hired, I was brought in as the Chief Marketing Officer. Um, and over time, um, I think there was a, a strong realization about how the criticality of understanding our clients. Um, and a, a real way of doing that is through research data and analytics. Um, and that those are really critical um, engines for sales, marketing, product development, right? Really the entire ecosystem of the firm. Um, and, it, you know, look, I, I'm very interested in behavior. We'll talk, I'm sure, a little bit more just sort of about, you know, my interests and sort of what through lines, uh, you know, I've seen in my life and my career. Um, but I'm just very interested in why people do the things that they do. And, you know, data analytics research allows you to do that. And so um, over time that became a growing part of, of my remit, my team's remit as well. Got it. Yeah, that, that curiosity there, I think, serves a marketer well. Yeah. And, you know, the ability to now with the tools that we have these days, the ability to really dig in and better understand those consumers is, is very cool. Yeah, you know, I think curiosity is something that I would say is a through line for my entire life. I was always the kid raising their hand, asking the questions, you know, and I was, I was that kid. Um, and, and curiosity and being just interested in other people and why they do what they do has just been something consistent. In fact, my background is not in financial services, nor is it in marketing. I was actually a filmmaker, um, and I, I really enjoyed um, documentary filmmaking and sort of television news, sort of long form. And I think it's because, like, you just listen and you ask some questions and the stories come to you. And, um, you know, and I think that's just, that's just been something that's always been interesting to me. So marketing and data and analytics is a, really a natural outgrowth of that. It sure is. But um, why don't you bridge that gap for our, our viewers here <laughs> on from going from filmmaking uh, into more of the financial services field and marketing. How did that happen for you? Yeah, well, look, I always, I always say it was a little bit of kismet, right, frankly. Right? Sure. So um, <laughs> I took some time off as a, as a filmmaker and as a writer when I had my children. Mm -hmm. um, so I have two children who are grown now. They've, they've left the nest. Um, but, you know, when they were 
you know, they were little, we were, um, they were in preschool, my daughter, my, my daughter is the older one, and she was in preschool, and I definitely had a sense that I wanted to be working, um, you know, and, but we were living in New Jersey, it was hard for me to get into New York to do more film and television things, um, and I met somebody um, at my daughter's preschool who worked for Merrill Lynch, okay. and, you know, becoming, because I came from filmmaking, um, strong writer, strong storyteller, right, and they needed somebody at Merrill at the time um, to be like an editor part-time, right? It was perfect for me, right? Like it was just perfect for, you know, a mom with two small children who wanted to be very engaged at home, but also wanted to start to build what was next for herself. And um, and I always joke that I worked part-time for about two weeks. <laughs> <Very often. laughs> um, you know, there was a lot of things that were changing at the firm at the time. They were moving from being, um, they were really completely changing their business model, their brand. Um, it was a wonderful time to be there, um, you know, and, and a lot of opportunities presented themselves if you were curious, you know, and so yeah. I went in there, I knew nothing about the business, I knew nothing about products and services and things, and yet I was being tasked to write about them, and so you had to ask a ton of questions and not be afraid to admit that you didn't know something. Um, it was the only way you were going to do your job and do it well, um, and then I was lucky, right, some wonderful leaders and mentors who were willing to take a chance on somebody who didn't have the traditional background um, yeah. and who were leaders who like change. Now, not, this was not an environment for everybody, but they typically move people around to different roles all the time. So someone like me who was looking to gain experience across multiple marketing domains, it was like heaven for me. And so my seven years there were um, just a, a, was, was like a masterclass in, you know, all the different dimensions of of marketing and marketing capabilities. So that's really the bridge. The bridge was luck, you know, frankly, um, right place, right time. Um, and just, you know, the entire ecosystem for me was just um, very, very lucky in my, my view. And sounds like meeting the right person, you know, and, yeah. and, and being able to articulate what you were looking for, you know, because you can meet the right people, but if you're not talking about what you need or what you're looking for, then they can't help you. So I love that story on lots of levels. <laughs> yeah. Look, I, I always say, you know, to, um, you know, women that I am friends with, that I mentor, you know, there's no one single path. Right. Like there's not, right. Of course there's the path of, you know, graduate with a, you know, a bachelor's in marketing and go to business school. And like, like there is that path. That's a very wonderful path for people for whom that's how their life happens, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and who know very clearly what they want to do from an early age. But, you know, careers are long and they can take you really, really interesting places if you're open to those opportunities. And so that's just, I, I always want to share that story and sort of my background, because I think people have an assumption of what it takes to get here. And it wasn't that at all, right? You know, and, and, and hopefully that gives, you know, women of all ages and backgrounds confidence that, um, you know, they can build the, the career that they want and that makes them happiest. Um, and there's no single path. Well, you essentially answered my very next question, which is perfect because about what advice do you wish you had gotten earlier in your career or what would you give, you know, what advice would you give someone now? I think that's, I mean, it may, you may have another answer as well, but that's a really good one. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I think it's, um, that very much is my answer, right? And I don't know that I knew it when I was younger, right? But I, you know, look, I was lucky to have parents. I'm an only child. That explains a lot about me. You know, I'm an only child. Um, and um, my parents were always very empowering, right? And, um, you know, there was never a question that I couldn't do anything I wanted, right? Like I, it just, it just, and it wasn't really stated and it wasn't like, you know, you know, my parents didn't rule with an iron hand or anything like that. It was just, there was this assumption that you would be happy and successful and you were smart and you could do things and things would, you'd have bumps and failures and, but that nothing was um, the be all and end all, right? And I think even as I've talked to my kids, because kids today are under so much more pressure than I, ever was a, like I wouldn't want to be a kid today for so many reasons social media being a piece of it which is a, a blessing and a curse and all this ability to compare yourself to others when it's not really comparison it's pretend what they are in their lives and like I think the pressure is really massive um but it, like I just I told my kids all along right even if you do badly in a college class 
right? Okay. Like, who cares? Like, I know yeah. that's a terrible thing to say as a parent, but like <laughs> the perspective that I have at my age versus theirs is yes, of course, GPA matters. Of course, you want to be dean's list. And if you're not for one semester, I'm far less worried about that. I'm far more worried that with my belief that learning is additive yes. and that if you didn't do well in a class, it actually shows you don't have mastery of content. And you may need that content down the road. So I'm far more concerned about mastering the content than what the grade is. And I'm, you know, I, my kids don't always, you know, follow my advice. They get, they would get pretty stressed about grades and things like that. But that's not my pressure. And I'm not even sure that's the world's pressure. It's the pressure that they and their peers and, and others put on them. So anyway, that, that's just something that I'm, I guess I'm a little bit more bounce with the ounce on some of these things. And yeah. life is long, careers are long, life is long. Um, and there's plenty of opportunities to continue to learn and even reinvent yourself at times. Absolutely. Yeah. So at Setup, we believe that everybody has a superpower. What would you say that yours is? Yeah. So I, I saw that that question and I was like, oh, wow. I mean, what, what would it be? You know, and then I, I realized that like um, part of being curious and also this data and analytics um, is about being able to somehow see the future. Right. And so, um, you know, I think that what I do, my interests are very much around predicting, predicting what will happen, um, whether that's through data science, where there's actually models and, and, and machine learning to do predictive analytics, or whether it's just seeing and listening to people, hearing unmet needs, finding white space for, for the company. Um, you know, I, I just think this idea of seeing or being able to anticipate the future is a superpower. Yeah. It's a really good one. <laughs> uh, that's a good one. Um, so we talked about curiosity. So what are the most important values that you demonstrate as a leader or look for in others when you're hiring for your team? Yeah, so um, empathy is probably the most important. Um, you know, my view is that um, I'm here to serve my team. I'm I'm not here to boss my team around, um, you know, and that leading with empathy is, has always been critical, but it's more critical now than ever. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And so um, it's the one gift that's been given to all of us through COVID and that I hope we never go back. Amen. So <laughs> leading with empathy. So empathy is something that is very, very important. Um, Yes, curiosity. I want to be surrounded by curious people. I actually want to be surrounded by people with more knowledge and more intelligence than I have. Um, it's boring otherwise, and, and I always like to be learning. So I like to learn from people that are my peers, people who are in my organization, et cetera. And I can learn from people at every level. Um, so that that is very important. Being a good communicator, though, is, is also important. I know that that um, may seem more like a hard skill, but it's a critical hard skill. Um, whether it's being able to communicate um, a change, whether it's being able to communicate a strategy, whether it's about communicating the steps we're going to take, right? Like uh, you just, if you're not clear in your communications and are able to adapt to different people, their needs, have their learning styles, like so being a communicator is so, so critical for leaders, you know, um, but also for anyone in an organization. I, you know, I think, you know, written communications, it's a lost art, you know, I think um, verbal communications, that's a different style, right? You have to speak in threes, you know, like it's just, um, and so getting really adept and investing in becoming a better and better communicator over time, um, I think is something that's very important. I agree. I think that is true across industries, but certainly specifically with marketing <laughs> you know we are storytellers at you are a storyteller by trade and nature um but yeah to be able to communicate that at any level in an organization because even if you're a junior person you know you may have a great idea or suggestion or perspective that they don't have and so to be able to articulate that and and be heard is so critical yeah absolutely absolutely so how do you coach and or mentor your team? You mentioned that you do some mentoring with other women. Um, what does that look like for you? Yeah, so, I, you know, look, I think that mentoring, really formal mentoring relationships um, 
need to be very much driven by the mentee and not the mentor, right? I think that is a piece of advice that I would give to anybody who is seeking a, a mentoring relationship is understand the accountability that you have to making the relationship successful. A mentor is not a therapist. Right. A mentor is not someone who's going to get you your next job. A mentor can help shape thinking that already exists for you, right? Um, and, and so I, when I'm mentoring people, women, women, but men also, um, the best relationships are when there's some clarity of thought or direction coming from the mentee, what they want to get out of it, where they like to go next in their career, balancing between two or three choices. Like there has to be something there. Um, if not, I actually do spend a lot of time helping people and trying to give them the tools they need to be introspective. Yeah. Right? I find a lot of people are, are dissatisfied. They, they want career advancement. But if you ask them, okay, you know, what skills do you want to build? What experiences do you want to have? They often can't answer. They often just want the next step, whatever it may be. But like, there's, there's nothing to do with that for them or for their manager or for me as a mentor. And so I spend a lot of time helping people get those tools to be introspective and be able to start to formulate and then articulate what they want. That's amazing. And I, I do think that that is something that just in our culture has not been something that is emphasized. Um, you know, taking that time to really check in with yourself, what you feel about something, what it is that you really want versus checking the boxes on this quote unquote career path that you're supposed to yeah. follow. Um, so I love that. And you must have a little part executive coach in you as well to, <laughs> to be able to understand that. That's amazing. <laughs> well, look, it's, it's our educational system. Our educational yeah. system teaches us that you move from A to B to C to D to E to F, right? that it, there's just a path and, and you're on it, whether you want to be on it or not. And right, there's a lot of kids who are very unhappy in high school and college, right? Because they actually don't want that path, but they don't know how to express it and they don't know how to express another path. Um, and so hence, you know, college, college loans and debt and all these things, you know, like, um, but that's our educational system. Our educational system in the, in the US at least doesn't leave room for exploration. The gap year, oh, the horror of that. No, it's not a horror. It's like somebody like trying to like see the rest of the world and have different learning experiences that aren't in a classroom, right? So I think that, you know, you have to understand where your team has come from. Right? And, and we've all been in this sort of structured, routinized, um, you step up the ladder kind of environment through education. And then we switch the game on them, right? Like when they come into the workforce and it's not like that at all. Um, and I think that um, people seek that certainty, but really the certainty has to come from you at a certain point. Great. All right, a couple of questions about agencies because yeah. at Setup, you know, we live in this space in between marketing agencies and brands or clients. So, you know, how do you at Invesco, how do you work with agencies today? Yeah, so look, we have um, wonderful agency partners. Um, you know, I, I like to work with fewer in deeper ways. It's my mm -hmm. preference. I find it um, beneficial to all parties. Um, so the first thing uh, in working with an agency is you need to make sure that there's a values and culture fit. That's the first thing. Um, DE&I is extremely important to me personally, to our firm. Marketing is a, a very interesting intersection point there because not only can we be leaders for DE&I within our organization, but oftentimes we're responsible for the things that are the face of the organization. Yeah. Um, and we like to think about the ENI through the entire value chain of marketing, and that very much includes procurement and our partners. And so no one is perfect, right? No one is perfect, but you want to make sure that you are working with agencies that share the values and the commitment to changing, right? To changing how we think about the ENI um, in various industries. Right, so that's the first thing. It's a values alignment. I used DEI as an example. There's other examples Absolutely. of values, but it was a it's a tangible example. I think people understand. Um, the second thing is there has to be a commitment on both sides. Right, the agency is not your servant, 
And the agency also needs to listen and understand your business and your clients because they may be different than what they're typically working with, right? Yeah. So there has to be this kind of shared commitment and accountability to listening and learning. Um, so that's the second piece. Um, and then I like to work with agencies that bring something to the table that either we don't have in-house or we wouldn't invest in in-house because it's so rapidly changing, right? So, you know, when you think about um, sort of higher order skill sets um, in marketing, those things, what's, what you do today is old tomorrow. And so you, I look for agencies that are going to bring the newest thinking to the table. We may not be ready to take it, but they're a way for me and my leadership team and, and others in our organization to kind of see what others in adjacent or even very different industries are doing. Because in the end, we're all trying to shape the decision-making and behaviors of people. And there's less lines between, oh, well, you do it this way in pharma, you do it this way in asset management, you do it this way in apparel, you do it this way in cosmetics. It's like you're really trying to influence the decisions and behaviors of people. And there's becoming more commonality across than ever before. So for us being in a intermediated, highly intermediated segment, um, I want to know what the most innovative e-commerce companies are doing. Like, I want to know that because we can learn from that. Absolutely. That's great. So since your title it has analytics in it, I want to ask a couple questions about results. Um, how do you show the value of marketing to the rest of your company? You obviously sit on the executive leadership team. You know, how do you bring, you know, prove to them that these investments in marketing are going well? Yeah, so um, I think, first of all, I'm, I'm very blessed to be at a firm that's quite forward thinking about marketing. Um, there's, from the top down, there's a view that distribution um, is a combination of sales and marketing. Um, and that each are of equal importance and bring different skills to the table. Yeah. So that's first and foremost, you have to be in an environment where you're not always looking over your shoulder and someone's like there, you know, with their basket trying to take their, your money, right? Like, and we are not in that environment at all. Right. So very blessed by that. And that is not common necessarily. So the first thing I did when I got here was we did um, an assessment of where things were from, a, I'll say just sort of standard marketing metrics, right? website traffic, social, blah, blah, like all the metrics that um, just to do a competitive analysis. That really helped me understand, because look, I was hired for transformation. That was why I was hired. There was a belief that marketing could be a differentiator for a firm like Invesco, unclear how to do it. Um, a lot of good things had been done, but there was this need for like future-proofing marketing. Um, and so that helped me really understand where we stood and I'd go back to those metrics periodically every year or two to see if we were improving because they're, they're signals of effectiveness. Mm -hmm. they're signals of effectiveness. Um, you know, we look at our metrics across a couple of dimensions. Um, brand and awareness is a big piece of it. Um, so we, we absolutely do brand trackers. We want to understand, um, you know, are we people aware of us? It's just a typical funnel. They're aware. Are they considering using us? Um, so that's a big piece of it. We look at um, NPS, so Net Promoter Score um, is, is really critical. Not just the big studies of NPS that you do every couple of years, mm -hmm. but at client experience listening posts as well. So making sure that you're always understanding um, is the experience that the user, client, user, whatever, is, is getting at that moment. Is it one, meeting the need, right? Are you satisfying them? And then are you delighting? Right. And that's what net promoter score will tell you. So we really focus on net promoter score. Um, you know, we we believe at the firm that sales and marketing contributes ultimately to um, net revenue and growth in AUM. And so we're always looking to ensure that we're aligning to those priorities. Right. And so, um, you know, and, you know, so, for example, um, we have a product in Vesco QQQ had a wonderful um, it had a wonderful month in March. Um, you know, we we're like, well, of course it did because we're the sponsor of the NCAA, and you know, we, you know, and that's not exactly why, but but we, you know, no one can tell what contribution that made or didn't make, but we know that we're all part of the win, right? Yeah. Like, and um, so I would just say traditional marketing metrics, 
we are doing um, some interesting work um, that's multi-year work because you have to do a lot of variations and tests around um, marketing mix model optimization. So making sure that we're putting our effort and our dollars against the right levers and the right proportions to meet our objectives. Um, and then, you know, that comes, what comes out of that over time is um, the ability to, to see contribution of marketing from an ROI perspective, right? But you have to do it in steps. Like people who jump to doing the, the marketing ROI models who haven't done the marketing mix optimizations, uh, you know, I think generally people look like, oh, well, of course, marketing thinks that they made all this money for the firm. But if you sort of do it in steps and you first do the optimization, then you start to see the contribution of those optimizations. Um, but that's a longer, that's a longer play for us. Got it. Well, is there a campaign or a program either at Invesco or in a past role that taught you the most that you would want to share with us? Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll do two. One from a prior life and, uh, you know, and you did, you did say campaign. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak to sort of campaign. So sure. um, I, when I, we were talking about Merrill Lynch earlier, I mentioned that when I joined their entire business model was changing, right? Like it wasn't just marketing, it was the entire business model. Mm -hmm. And um, they were going from, you know, what was known as Wall Street to Main Street, right? So yeah. the brokers to being more upmarket wealth managers. Now, you could have done that through marketing and just said that you were that, but first they did really fundamental changes to everything in their business, right? How they selected advisors, how they trained them, how they segmented their clients. Like it was a business initiative, right? That became a massive and one of the most successful in the industry brand initiative of Total Mail. And what that taught me is marketing can be extremely powerful if the business work has been done, right? That external manifestation of a business strategy can absolutely determine the success or failure of that business strategy. However, an external manifestation of a brand or something that is not rooted in the realities of the business is putting lipstick on a pig. Absolutely. Right? And so that's what I learned there. I also learned about all the different levers you can pull to activate a brand and you know, it was very exciting, but deep down what you saw was it worked because the business strategy was solid. And right. then of course the creative and the execution was amazing, but you could have had all that amazing execution with no solid business strategy in place. It's nothing would have happened. The authenticity, right? It's, it's like, if it was smoke and mirrors, it just doesn't land the same way know. as the yeah. authenticity. Yeah. People that's know. awesome. Yeah. So that was something I really learned. I tried to carry it with me. I'm very conscious of when we're just like saying something and it's not really real and, you know, like, um, and it's never successful. Uh, yeah. You know, I think the, the work that we're doing um, now, so you mentioned campaigns, so I'll stay on the campaign side. And then we maybe talk about things outside of campaigning that I think are really critical for marketing. Um, but the, the partnership and the uh, relationship we have with the NCAA with Invesco QQQ, um, and Invesco is something I'm really, really proud of. Um, you know, it, it takes so many people to execute that um, all over our firm, right? Even just our compliance partners to get them comfortable in these spaces being, you know, really streaming and social media and influencers and all the things that are necessary for us to be contextually relevant in that environment and not be like some um, one of my colleagues says, dad, it's a disco, right? We couldn't be that. We had to be really relevant um, in that context. And, and it's just been wonderful to see how people have gone along for the ride on that. Um, I'm not a big sports marketing fan, right? I mean, you know, people um, always are coming to you for sponsorships and stadium namings and this and that. And in general, I'm, I don't actually think there's great benefit to that. It's very, very, very hard to measure. Yeah. But the NCAA was just such an interesting um, opportunity because one, it's full year, it's not to just one team. It allows us to activate for employees, for clients, for our brand, right? And in our community, right? Because financial literacy is extremely important to us as a firm. And we're able through the NCAA to reach, you know, college students at large and specifically 500,000 um, college athletes with a program that we built. Um, in service of the NCAA called How Not to Suck at Money. And, you know, like it's, 
I like, love I just, that. <laughs> the, the work is just so comprehensive. And to the point about business strategy, it hits everything that matters to us, um, both values like financial education, and then also in terms of our business and our business model. Um, so super proud of that work. That said, like that's campaign, right? Yeah. The other piece I think that um, is really critical for marketers is that data and analytics dimension, right? Really, really knowing your client um, better than your competitors. And so to build those capabilities in-house primarily has just been such a joy to watch. And, and in this realm, I am surrounded by people far smarter than me um, and, and, you know, in every way. Um, but to have that be a guiding principle for us to know our clients better than our competitors do, um, it's just a really awesome purpose, right? You know, and, and people get up every morning and they know that that's why um, they're putting in the hard work. So important and so important as younger people get into the workforce, because that's so much more important to that, you know, this younger generations, which I think is just going to make all of our companies better. So I agree. <laughs> I, I agree a hundred percent. All right. So just a few little fun questions to wrap things up today. Um, what is a quote or a book or a movie or a band, you know, any of the, this media that inspires you or really speaks to you? Yeah. So, um, you know, there, there was a book that I read um, some years ago that really transformed how I thought about leadership. And so I do want to make sure that I share it for the, for our viewers and maybe they pick it up if they want to, which is um, Team of Teams, um, which is uh, General Stanley McChrystal's book on leadership and the lessons he learned um, as a general um, and how old hierarchical ways of working stopped as wars became more complex and decentralized and sort of how those lessons apply to leadership and empowering people who are closest to the work, right? It really is transformative for anybody who grew up in a hierarchical leadership structure, which most of us did, um, and how that that is no longer going to work, not just because people don't enjoy that, but also because <laughs> Um, you can't know the nuance of uh, the client and the client experience from a high level. You have to trust and empower um, people who are closest to, the, to those experiences. So it's just a wonderful book. Um, he's a super interesting speaker and, um, as well. So um, I, would, I would advise people to, um, to take a look at that. Um, you know, my favorite band um, is Counting Crows. For people who know me know that. Right. Um, my favorite band is Counting Crows. Um, you know, the other thing that I'm very conscious of is um, figuring out a way to let my mind kind of get dull, right? You know, like we're on all the time, like we're reading all the time, writing all the time, listening all the time. And so I was, I read this during COVID and I, I was so happy to read it because I, I thought I was weird. I'll watch Friends reruns, like just in the background and they just make me so happy, you know, and I get it. There's like, like it's, it's, completely unreal, but there was an article written during COVID that I read, it was like New York Times or Economist or something that was like, why, do, why are people watching Friends reruns during COVID? And it was that, it was like, your mind needed a break from all the stress and frankly horror that you were seeing um, in your own community and around the world. And so like a, a pretend happiness, you know, was, was something that people, and there was some like brain chemical reason why it worked um, as well. Like it was a science-based uh, reason, but I'll do things like that. I'll watch cooking shows and stuff like that just to turn off. Um, and, and I think that's very needed. Other people do other things, right? Like, you know, that's um, fascinating specifically but, for me because uh, I may or may not have watched a couple of friends episodes last night while I came to <laughs> the kitchen and, you know, kind of did other stuff. <laughs> it is, it's, it's like background music, it right? Like it's just really funny. Yeah, so. yeah. Cause you know, I'm not having to pay attention to every little thing that's happening, yeah. but it is, a, it's comforting somehow. And I, I have that. It, it is. Yeah. It was interesting. And like this article, I'll, I'll send it to you if I can find yeah, it. But it was like, yeah. there was like a brain chemistry reason why people were finding it comforting like and I it was just it. I was like wow that's interesting. Wow. That binge watching can be like really stressful like like you have to pay yeah. attention and like you know and so, yeah. that's great yeah. so other than your family where do you find joy outside of work yeah so um you know I, I grew up in the arts right so whether it was filmmaking I was I danced I was a ballet dancer all through high school or my childhood and through high school so I love the arts right and I think it's been 
Um, something I didn't realize how much I missed it, um, not being able to have access to the arts um, and now have gone to a number of, of things, went to see company, have gone to the ballet and stuff. And it's just, um, it's just kind of life affirming, which is wonderful. I also love live sports. Um, I'm a huge uh, ice hockey fan, Washington Capitals. Um, and so seeing live sports again, right? Being able to go to the Capitals, play the Rangers at Madison Square Garden. Like, like you forget, like it's just not the same watching it on TV or something like that. So I think this um, access to live arts and live sports um, is something that really does bring me a lot of, a lot of joy. That's great. Yeah, there's something about that energy in the room, right? Yeah. With everyone yeah. else is un it's unreplicatable. <laughs> yeah. And I'm I'm finding that it's even greater now because there's pent up energy. You know, so there was pent yeah. up energy from the past two years. And so people are particularly appreciative, you know, of of the of the artists. Absolutely. Or the athletes. Yeah. So is there a brand that you've never worked on that you most admire and tell us why? Yeah, so um, I think that's always a hard question because you don't really know what's going on inside their company, right? So it's yeah. like a pure outsider's perspective. Sure. Um, you know, look, I, I have a lot of respect for Nike and how Nike um, really puts their customer, their client, front and center in all the way through from product ideation, product development, uh, marketing, obviously, servicing, et cetera. Um, they're also very focused on innovation, right? They're focused on innovating in their space, but they're also focused on innovation more broadly. I just think they're a, a fascinating um, company and they have so many different types of clients yeah. that they're serving. And yet they figured out how to appeal to the most elite athlete and, and the person maybe who had surgery and just had to buy sneakers so that they can start to walk again, right? Like, and that entire spectrum from old to young and sophisticated to newbie. And they, they still, everyone can get under that umbrella of just do it. And yeah. I think there's, you know, there's something really magical about, um, how they operate and think, and obviously they're massive, like they're just enormous and massive and global, yet they're staying true to their ethos in, in everything. Yes. Well, um, I'll just ask you one last question. Is there a question that you wish I had asked? <laughs> you know, is there something <laughs> else that you would like to share that we didn't uh, touch on today? Yeah, look, I, I think, you know, the one thing I, I'd, I'd really like everyone to take away um, from this is, you know, as you're thinking about um, your career to realize, you know, how much flexibility there is, it's only going to be more so now um, with hybrid work and, um, and that it is very much yours to craft um, in partnership with your, your employer and your manager, et cetera. But there, that's a big piece that sort of self, that ownership of your own career is very important. Um, you know, always stay curious. We talked about that, but I think um, if there's one thing that I could say you know, whether it's your, as a marketer, whether it's about your career, whether it's just about the world around you, um, is to, is to stay curious, assume good intent and reserve judgment, you know, like that whole, like sort of open-mindedness, um, piece, um, and then just, you know, remember marketing's fun, right? There's no, there's no crying in marketing, right? It's, it's, this is, <laughs> this is a, a really, um, important, uh, but if there's not fun in it, it's probably not going to be good marketing. Um, and so there, there does have to, like, you have to find the joy um, in what you're doing and what you're creating. It is a, it's, a, it's a science. Yes, it is very much a science, but it's also a creative pursuit. And that intersection of art and science, um, just remember, it, it should be fun. Oh, I love it. Well, Emily Pachuda, Chief Marketing and Analytics Officer of the Americas at Invesco, thank you so much for joining our CMO Spotlight today. It was a real pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Amanda.